is my first seminar that I kind of get to wing it myself, so just bear with me. Uh, we're going to get through this. We have some uh, a good operating career, career panel here. This is part two of the other career panel for our operating committee we've done. And uh, this should be very interesting. We have some very interesting people on our operating committee, and they have a lot of experience to share with you and good information. Um, I would like to welcome two new operating committee folks that we have. One is Marsha Cousins. She's going to be on the career panel today. And she's right located back here in the back, the lovely lady there. She's waving. And uh, we also have Mr. Eric McKim. He's not here with us today, but he should be here. If not next month, he'll be here within uh, another month of our seminar. Um, another thing is I'd like to have to extend a warm welcome to our five new camp students. And I'm thankful that we are getting more students, and we love having the more the merrier. That's how I see it. And we want you to learn and grow while you're in this program. Um, I'm going to go over some miscellaneous items. We have a camp remind, and I don't know, I know a lot of you have a remind on your phone. I can easily text everyone, so please do me a favor, real quick. If you have it, your phone out, or you want to write this down, I will give you the text option of how to uh, keep contact with me or for me to get messages to you, like quick reminds, okay? The text, you just text to this number, it's 81010, and then in the message, area you'll type in at camp c a m p then s t u d so it looks like at camp stud okay you need to repeat it i'll repeat it to you just let me know um also everyone sees it's gotten cold outside it's snowing and we got this getting this cold weather so last year we came up with an idea about if there was any in, um like cancellation for camps, and we had like uh, bad weather. We have a weather policy. So if you have received one of these, please grab one on the back table back there so you'll know what happened and where to look if we have uh, bad weather. That's another reason why I want you to have the remind because it'll help you remember or see information coming out that I send out. Because I get right on and I make sure I send any messages that you need. If anyone doesn't understand also our attendance policy, I'm pretty sure everyone understands it, but if there's anybody that is having a miscommunication or misunderstanding, please see me right away because we have a policy for our attendance in place because we love seeing your smiling, cheery faces here, and we want you to know that we do have a way to keep you in the program. And if you need to follow those, those guidelines, we can help you with that, okay? Uh, Also, a new camp uh, seminar schedule is going to come out next month. So we should have that ready for you. I didn't send, I don't think I sent the attachment, this email. I did send it. I did send the camp email. So you will have December for next month when our um, holiday session is. And um, that's the last one you get for this year. So we'll have another one coming up for 2017. So make sure when you get that schedule, you mark your calendars right away. So there's no excuses that you didn't have it on your calendar, OK? Uh, also, I sent you an invitation to our holiday celebration. This is a very fun time for all of us and a very good time for us to, to um, celebrate our success for the program. And um, I'd like to see all of you there, even your families are invited. So please get back with me about how many um, guests that you're going to have at the seminar, which is our holiday celebration. What I'm going to do is send this guest list around and just have you please put your name, the number of guests that are attending, and your shirt size. This year we have... Um, a gift idea to do shirts. So I just need your shirt size so we can go ahead and take care of that. If I don't have any of that from you, I can't put in an order for you, okay? And I will be able to get a shirt for you. So I like to see everybody turn their information in so I can go ahead and include you. Also, we have juniors in the room. How many juniors do I have? Okay, good. Okay, juniors, we're gonna schedule something called your junior council sessions. That's going to come up the week after we return from uh, Thanksgiving break. And I need for you all to keep an eye out for your emails. 
And I have some information, important information coming your way so you can start scheduling for that, uh, that time. And because uh, we want to make sure that we talk to you before the spring of the year. We start planning this event really goes out to the businesses and looks for how many job openings are available for the summer. And that's where we'll be able to connect you from there. So we start have to get started on it right away. We're doing it by the end of this month, this year, because it's, it's something we are in crunch time, so we just have to make sure we get to it as soon as we can so we don't have to feel so rushed and you don't feel rushed. Okay, also December 2nd. That looks like it's like two weeks away. Um, Mr. Venturello and myself, we're gonna visit the success class during period four or five. I don't know if any of you have success with Mr. Shepherd or Mrs. Lewis at that time, but we're going to visit the classroom and recruit for our juniors. We are very slim on juniors right now. We need some juniors. So if any of you have friends that are juniors and maybe they inquired about camp or asked you about it, or you can share with them what camp has to offer, it would be a nice opportunity for them to come on board and um, be a part of this good program. Also, this is one thing I know Mr. Venturella always tells you, and I think I'm always telling you too, make sure you read your emails. Completely read your emails. I, I'm guilty of that too. Sometimes I don't read the full email, and I say I get that information, but please, 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 please read your emails. I appreciate it, because communication is key, and we need to all be on the same page, okay? Uh, seniors, don't forget to fill out, I don't know if I have seniors in here, but any seniors, if you have not done your senior update card or kept completing it, I need you to just stop and see me. If you can, my office is over here. You can just stop in and fill the rest of it out because I know a lot of you have already applied to several colleges and we need you to make sure to um, get all that information in if you were to start applying for your scholarships. I need that information as well. Uh, we're going to do a recap real quick from last month's seminar. Those folks that went to the engineering seminar, how many of, of y'all went to the engineering seminar? Just you, Pat? Oh, Austin? Okay. How about the healthcare breakout? Who did that one? Okay. Can I get a little bit of feedback from any of you just to hear what you have to say about what you took away from that particular breakout session that you attended? Anybody? Yes, Jamie. So, Mr. Brunner has a mic right here. So, um, we spoke to a lady, her name was Diana, and she, her last name is, actually her name is Diana Hunter. She was an advanced nurse practitioner, and she, um, she just basically talked about like what it takes to be a nurse practitioner, all the different things you can do with a nurse practitioner, like you can work in a doctor's office, or you can work in a hospital, or you can go on and get your doctor's degree in your nurse practitioner, and then have your own practice. And then we spoke to Darren Vaughn. Vaughn, yeah, Mr. Vaughn, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so um, he, he talked about how he's like a physician assistant, all the different things that he does with that as well, um, all the different opportunities you have in that field. But it's just a good guy. Thank you, Jamie. That's good information to know. Did anyone else have any takeaways or any feedback from it? Zach, with you in engineering, right? Okay. The, the, the guy that we talked to was Hudson Conley. Uh, he's a paracontrol about just all the types of uh, aircraft that we have built for uh, many different organizations and all that. Uh, he said that, he said the map that you need to build into the field, he said a lot actually. <laughs> no. Thank you, Zach. Does anyone else want to share their thoughts? Okay. Well, it was a, it was really good to have both of them here. I didn't get a chance to 
can sit on, on, on either of them because I'm still running around doing several things. But it's a good thing that they are here to share that information with you so you know going out to the work field what you need to do. Actually, first and foremost, what you need to do with your studies, what you need to take. You know, Zach was just mentioning how much math you need to take. So I guess being an engineer, you do have to take a lot of math. So that's something that I'm, that's beneficial for you to know. Um, did anyone have any questions about anything that I mentioned at all? All right. So what I need all of you to do real quick is turn your cards around, your name cards around. This is going to help our career panel be able to see your name. If you ask a question, they can respond to you, okay? All right. And now I would like to have our operating committee folks come up. We have Mr. Rich Morocco, Mr. Mike Demchak, Mr. Ron Wilkoff, De uh, Diane Miser, Marcia Cousin, and Debbie Myers. And thank you all for being here today on this cold, cold Sunday. So, we're going to ask get a chance to open up with some questions to you. Um, first, we're going to actually ask all of you to introduce yourselves, please. And um, maybe we'll start with you, Ms. Cousins. We'll go from you all the way back down. And I'll um, share with the students um, your name and what you are doing right now and what your career is or what field you were in and then from there.
High School, the University of New Mexico. When I came back, uh, I started a company alongside with my father called Bonds Working School. Now the industrial side worked with all the contractors, heavy and light contractors, and in this area in Ohio. Ron's working at store, we are a retail. Most stores are retail. And we carry clothing for the contractors and also safety equipment. And now that my son is in it, he has started uh, with his own business building our companies with the internet. Okay, I'm uh, Mike Demchak.
as a business partner with the management team to resolve issues, any kind of issues, dry changes, um, you know, act as the change agent and try to make it this transition as smooth as possible. Um, compensation, benefits, human management relations, um, just pretty much the whole gamut of human resources. So that's what I did for the last 30 years. So since then I have retired and you now I run, help um, with Diane and I and uh, Ms. Sarah, we run the technical camp organization and help out with the camp. Okay, now it's our audience turn. You get to ask questions based on what you heard and the uh, bios that you have in front of you. When I sent you your email, I mentioned you come up with three questions, at least three questions, to start asking them. If anyone has questions, they can open it up right now. Caitlin. This one's for Ms. Cousin. I was just wondering if you were always, if you always knew that you were going to be a teacher, basically, or did you ever have doubts during your years? Honestly, I knew when I was six years old that I wanted to be a teacher. I, um, too, went through Kansas City schools, and my first grade teacher really inspired me. I used to ask her for all the extra worksheets because I would take them home and I had two sisters. Everything I learned in school, I would teach them. My favorite gifts as a child were a blackboard and a black magic marker. So you can tell I always had passion to be a teacher. Uh, my work as an administrator, um, I would not say that that was part of the vision that I had, but as time went on and more experience in the classroom is what led me into administration. Courtney? Hi. Oh, okay. My question for Mr. Demchak. Is that Yes. Okay. Um, what was the process like getting into like um, law? Like what was the transitioning like? Was it kind of difficult? Was it kind of to go through? So if you have uh, like a good LA, LA, 
LASC sport, but like not as good of a GPA, it's like, would it still be okay? Would you still get a okay job? Like, you know? Well, hold on for a second. The LS, you're talking about the LSAT score? Yeah. That's to get into law school. It has nothing to do with that. Basically, law school is three, three, three years full time. So, if, for example, in Ohio, we have, I think, seven or eight law schools. Akron, Gate One, Ohio State, Case Western, Toledo, Cincinnati, uh, and there's a, there's a few other ones. But if you're going to apply to law school, you have to take your LSAT, I would say, probably no later than very early in your senior year. And a lot of students will take it in their junior year. Now, you can take it more than once. I mean, a lot of times, you know yourself, you're going to do better if you take a test a second time. So, and you know, the schools will consider that. If, if there's a big jump from your first score to your second score, they'll take that into consideration. But getting back to your question, the LSAT is a very important all day test, and uh, it basically measures reading comprehension and that sort of thing. Well, there is a, probably, I would say, a bottom line, but the higher the score, the better chance you're going to have to get into school. What's so important about your GPA is that that is a reflection of how hard you're working in school. When you have good grades, and you have a good, decent GPA, even though your LSAT score may not be real high, they know that you're a hard worker. Hard work uh, probably at the end is probably going to be more important than anything else. So, my question is for Ms. Debbie Myers. Um, I graduate in three weeks, three days, and about nine and a half hours with my bachelor <laughs> in psychology. And um, I decided like two months ago that I wanted to change my minor from business to management because there, honestly, because there's less math involved. Do you need like statistics and micro and micro and macro for human resources or is it okay just to have the management? Question whether or not you have to have micro and macroeconomics. Is that the question? Is it oh, like human resources? Do, would I need to use math like a lot? Like should I just work well, on something? Yeah, that there's, there's a lot of different areas of human resources. You could be a benefit specialist and you're pretty much dealing a lot with math and, and a lot. There's a lot of statistics involved, but I wouldn't say you have to be, you know, an accountant. I mean, you don't have to be a mathematician, but there, surprisingly, there is a lot of math involved because you're working well, most of the time with a business, and a business is driven by the numbers and profitabilities and headcounts, and um, so in, in an affirmative action plan, there's a lot of utilization numbers that you have to have. So. I guess it depends on what area that you specialize in. Uh, labor relations, when I do that, um, there's probably less math. I mean, you have to present to management what your parameters are. And so there's some basic math that's involved in that, but it's, it's like wage survey data and that kind of thing. So you don't have to have a high level of statistics in that. Is, does that answer your question? Thank you. question is also for Ms. Myers. Um, when you were talking, you said you had to act as the change agent. Did I hear that correctly? Um, what did you mean by that? Well, uh, quite often, human resources, it depends on which branch of HR you're in, but I primarily was um, a lot of times in a plant level. And so, quite honestly, a lot of the plants are old and antiquated and they have old work rules. And so you are driving change, and so you're acting as the primary change agent with the management team to drive the changes through the work culture and kind of changing the work culture. I left on 
on the corners of many of the desks a union contract. And it's just an example of the stuff. One of the things that you can do in human resources, those are some contracts that I help negotiate. And so, um, in a manufacturing setting, there's a lot of work rules that are very stringent and um, it may be difficult to work around. So a lot of it is you had to act as a change agent to drive change throughout the organizations to make improvements. And so that's, there's a whole branch of human resources called organizational development. And in that, your primary, primary job and responsibility is driving change. You, you go out, you benchmark other organizations for what kind of work practices they may have, and you implement those changes in the workforce and you drive that. Um, so that's a little bit, it's kind of an area of expertise, but if you're in a generalist role, you're responsible for doing a lot of that. Did that answer the question?
Um, I have a question for Mr. Demchek. Um, for those of us looking to go into law school, would you suggest getting an associate with arts or an associate of science? Associate of Arts or Associate of Science? best thing you can do is just do the best you can 
at every subject you take, and eventually it will fall into place for you. That make sense? Okay, Rich, as I'm making my way over here, uh, I went up to the University of Akron. I know my, my daughter, Savannah, who's a uh, fifth grader now, is interested in engineering. But they uh, gave us some information about a new study of engineering. I don't know, I think it's just relatively new, and that's corrosion engineering. And I didn't know if you knew anything about that or could shed some light on that. It's supposed to be this emerging field, I do believe, unless it's been around, I just don't know it, uh, to help study and uh, help out with, I guess, lessening the corrosion of some batteries, bridges, roads, and things like that. Uh, what can you tell us about that emerging field? Is that something that students should be looking at if they're going into engineering? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Ken. Uh, it usually, it, corrosion engineering has been around for a long time. Uh, it's a division of mechanical engineering and it's a study of how things rust and deteriorate. Uh, one example is pipelines. They put anodic protection, and you get involved with a little bit of electricity. You, you, uh, the process of corrosion is the moving of electrodes. If you uh, stop those electrodes from, from moving through the metal, it retards that corrosion. Uh, we ran electricity through a bridge bed to stop reinforcing steel from corroding. Works very effectively. Runs for the solar panel. So that's been around, but they've been doing a lot more experimental things on that. Um, obviously, when you mine an ore, mold it into steel, it wants to return back to the ore that it came from in the ground. So that's what they're trying to prevent. Good field. Um, everything you have in steel corrodes in industry. Uh, your, your car, so uh, if they have an interest in that, that's a very interesting field to get into, but it's run out of the mechanical section. My question is also for Mr. Afanapa. Um, it said you handled a $2 million budget with 40 employees. How did you manage that? Did you do that at the age of 30? That's kind of impressive. How did you do that? And, uh, I was 30 years old, I became bridge engineer for Stark County. Uh, we had 40 employees. The budget for the bridge department was $2 million. Uh, a portion of that certainly went to the salaries for those 40 men. And I had to take the, the rest of it and plan, design, construct, and maintain probably 400 bridges in the county. So $2 million doesn't go very far when you're talking about 400 bridges. You take a typical bridge to replace it, it's about $150 a square foot. So you really had to pinch pennies uh, with the $2 million. But I had the opportunity at a very early age to work with 40 men that were older than me, knew a lot more than I did. I learned very quickly that, sure, I had a college degree, but these guys knew construction. They knew how to build things and I struck up a nice relationship with those guys and when I retired from government, they came and thanked me for what I did for them. I didn't even know I did anything. Just to listen to their ideas, what they had to offer for uh, the things that I was doing to make it easier. So, uh, did I answer your question? Um, and this is um, an open-ended question for the entire panel. How much continuing education was necessary for your careers? For um, educators, it's pretty much lifelong. Um, to be able to um, advance in the field of education, most often a master's degree is required.
short seminars, it could be courses that you're taking, um, a variety of different learning opportunities, some of those on site, some of them online, but it is uh, critical for your success, not only say in a classroom or a building, but also just the interest in being at the top of your field. In engineering, I've been telling everyone here in my engineering uh, sessions that a bachelor is sufficient. Four years is sufficient. You get a nice salary, a nice job when you get out. I got my master's degree because I had the opportunity presented to me after I graduated. There's no sense paying a lot for a master's degree when every engineering employee out there will pay you to go to school. So bachelor's degree is plenty in engineering. Uh, just as every other field you're going to hear down here, uh, all through the panel, we do have continuing education. We have to get 15 hours in a seminar, something because engineering profession evolves. Almost any engineering uh, uh, profession that you get into, mechanical, electrical, civil, structural, uh, it changes constantly. So you have to keep up on that. But uh, what you don't want to do is after four years go directly into graduate school graduate with a master's degree put it on your resume and try to compete with people that just have bachelor's degrees because some employers won't pay the extra ten fifteen thousand dollars for that master's degree they'll take somebody with a bachelor's that's the case in engineering not so true with maybe some of the other professions so get your master's degree in engineering get out get a job start earning some good money and then let your employer send you to graduate school. Business is generally uh, the same thing. Four years, just make sure that in your business degree, you've got your math, your accounting, types of uh, businesses, also law. So you wanna, four years is plenty. school now, um, and, and I may, just because I love to learn, so it's 
So it, it just always, it, it's always a good opportunity to learn. So yes, we're always learning. And, and, and human resources is not any different uh, as the other um, areas. You, you have to continuously learn in whatever field you're in to stay current because, as you know, things change so quickly. So you have to stay current on um, it, a lot of legal changes in the laws and the rules. And, uh, and so I, I would say every employee that in, in our businesses um, had some form of educational requirement, um, training and development that was expected of them every year. And there are some um, Society of Human Resources has two different de designations that um, if you uh, pass your certification, then uh, you have continuing education also. So, good question, thanks. Hey, Mr. Bruner, I did want to add that in education, you, they don't pay you to go back to school, but you do make more money with the more education that you have in the whole education system. Just, I mean, that's just something else to consider. Are there any education majors out there, or are students considering going into education? Get my exercise. I just wanted to get done. I just wanted to to get done and, and start. So I, I didn't party crazy or, or anything like that. I was I was pretty um, mild, but calm. But again, I commuted for two years and then just lived on campus for a year. Well, I can tell you, going away to college, far away where you can't drive home for weekends and have your parents do your laundry, um, it's an experience that makes you grow up very fast because you're on your own and you are meeting all these different people and you want to get into a good crowd. I got into a fraternity and um, I met a lot of a lot of people that way and going into classes was very interesting because you have all different types of people that are in your classes. I, I had American Indians, I had cowboys being out in Mexico, and it was very different. And you learn all those different cultures, which was very interesting. And um, you eat a lot of Mexican food. <laughs> so that was different, but um, it is a great experience to uh, to be away from home and have to do all the things on your own and you come back a different person, that's for sure. I'll, uh, I'll add to that, uh, Ron is correct. It's a real experience leaving home for the very first time. I went to Ohio State University in Columbus. A lot of students down there, so it was like a city within a city. And I remember my first, my freshman year, the dinner dorm, came home about every other weekend, uh, only two hours away. Uh, sophomore year, joined a fraternity, I came home like once a month. Junior year, uh, I slipped up at home and I said, I told my mom, it was, uh, I, I gotta get home right away. She said, this is your home. So eventually, I lived away from home so long, you began calling it home. Um, I really enjoy living away from home because you grow up very quickly, and uh, it was it was an enjoyable experience. If you can afford it and uh, you can live on campus, I strongly recommend it. You meet new friends, new people. Uh, it's an enjoyable experience. 
I too had the opportunity to live away from home, and I found that it really helped to develop my independence as well as my personality. Uh, you now are the one making decisions for each day, each hour, and where you put your priorities. It also uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, get to know not only others there on campus, but out into the community, to be able uh, to work and volunteer, to learn about other cultures and other types of individuals that came from backgrounds that were not uh, similar to my own, but really uh, opened a world um, that I would not have had if I stayed here. Uh, my first couple of years after graduation, I had the opportunity to teach in Australia. And I think that, again, because of being on campus and learning about these different opportunities, um, really changed my life, my world, uh, because of that. Well, sort of in the same Vein is the college, the college or college experience question. Uh, the, the grades are obviously important, the test scores are important, but what organizations or extracurricular activities that you did in college do you feel best prepared you or taught you best life lessons preparing you for your career? And then that's open for anybody on the panel. Which extracurricular activity you had that best prepared you for your career? Uh, maybe I'll start. I think the American Society of Civil Engineers had a student chapter. That was one for me that uh, moved me off into uh, my career within civil engineering. But I think from a social standpoint, uh, working with people, not only did I get some benefit from some of the classwork and working as a team there, but the fraternity. Certainly it's a social group, but we had projects that we worked on together, um, and that was also enjoyable. So if you can afford a fraternity, you're on a big campus like Ohio State, it, it was good for me at the time to uh, join a fraternity. But, uh, and then within the fraternal structure, uh, what they call it the Greeks, there are other uh, committees that you can get on and working together outside of the engineering field. But I think mainly for me, it's joining your student chapter in whatever field of engineering you're in. I would say that um, if you want to focus in human resources or accounting, there's organizations that um, the Society of Human Resource Management, um, there's also an accounting, accounting um, I forget the name of it, I've been out of it for so long, there's an organization that you can join for that as well. But I would say that work experiences are going to be very critical, any kind of job shadowing, and if you can do some kind of co-oping because you're going to be competing when you go out into the workforce and when you look, whatever you can do to build your resume, to show that um, that you can manage your time effectively and um, prioritize and, and any kind of work experience that you can have. If you can co-op, if you're going to be an engineer, I would definitely say um, do the co-oping um, for that. And um, any, kind of, any kind of relevant work experience would be helpful. You know, going along with that, Debbie, uh, when you talk about work experience, it's also critical um, how much you volunteer. And I know you, as young people, are already involved in that. Uh, having had the opportunity to hire uh, teachers and administrators, um, we looked at that. Um, how their uh, life was balanced and how much uh, time, you know, they gave to the wider community. I would say too, even um, going back to my experience, but also on any campus, to look for something to get involved in. Like I remember doing student activities council where they had Christian life. Any, if you're not going to do the fraternity thing, but just to have that group to belong to, 
That'll make college more enjoyable when you find that nucleus of run on a, a running club, but find something so that that that's enjoyable too, that, that you have that connection, as well as your classes, but also just find something to connect with that makes school fun. When I was in the fraternity, one thing I learned going to meetings was Robert's Rules, the Robert's Rules procedure, how to run a meeting. And that has helped me so much after college because I'm on the board of Stark State College and there you have to know what you're doing and running a meeting with a lot of people in it. And I was president for three years. So I'm glad I had that experience in college, how to run a meeting and do a good job of it. My question isn't for anyone in particular, but how do you guys feel about working while in college? Working, working while in college? If you can do it, I think it's, it's uh, very valuable. Yeah, I think that, first of all, I think it uh, uh, helps, helps you manage your time. Because you know now that you're working, but you also have to get your studies done. So you become a little more disciplined. And I think sometimes you can make a few extra bucks, right? Because you're working, you're just spending money. But as long as you can do it, I mean, you're there for school, you're there to get the best grades you can. And I think working, just like a lot of these people on the panel said, I mean, you're going to, those are lessons you're going to learn from your labor force. So I, th I think it's a good thing myself. I, I can say, as someone that recruits re 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 a lot of recruiting in my career that looking at resumes that of students that work versus didn't work, I think that you look at that as them as some measurement of their work um, ethic. You know, do they have a strong work ethic? Are they going to come to my organization and work extremely hard? So I I can appreciate it's very it's hard to work and go to school. Um, but I think that there's some value added to that, and I would always look at someone's resume that, that did work or did some kind of extracurricular or something um, as some measurement of the work ethic. In engineering, I looked at it two ways. Uh, Acme U has a co-op program in that you are off entirely, no classwork, and you go with an employer, and one semester you go to work. Then you go to Akron U and you take your engineering courses. When I went to Ohio State, they did not have a co-op program. I vowed as when I started as a freshman, I would graduate in four years. That meant in engineering, and I don't want to scare anybody away from engineering, minimum of 17, 18 hours, uh, course hours a semester, a quarter. Those who worked took five years, six years to get out, but they're paying that tuition for two more years. So you are making money, and if you need to make money, that's important, because uh, uh, obviously it keeps you in school. But when you look at concentrating on taking the maximum number of class hours that you can and not working, um, I, I don't know how I would work with 17, 18 hours. I mean, it's uh, and, and devote the time that I need to my engineering courses. So you have to weigh those. Uh, it, it's good to work, but my intern work was done in the summer times during the holidays when I worked for a consulting firm, and uh, was outside of my college days when I go to campus. I concentrate on study. Can you explain how that happened in the process that went? 
you get there? Yes. Um, well, I just had the um, the director of human resources a position became available in the facility that I was working in, and he came to me and asked me if I would apply for that position and if I had any interest to think about it. And so um, I gave some consideration and did uh, apply for it. And so I did make the transition from accounting into human resources and uh, then never looked back. I was glad that I did that. It's an easy one. Uh, what did you find to be the most gratifying part of your career? So what kind of juice do you want to get out of bed every day and you know, go plug it out in your, in your career? that when I, um, well, when I was working a couple years ago, um, I, what drove me was um, the relationships that you build and that your, um, your driving changes and that you're um, working with other people and they're dependent on you for doing a good job and getting your work done. And so there's always some interdependence with other people. Most of the time you're working as a team to accomplish a goal, and so you have other people that is that are on your team, and so I, I think you just drive a lot of energy and passion from working with all those teams and, and having the same commitment and passion of getting something accomplished and um, and being, feeling that you contribute in some way every day. You go to work, someone's counting on you to accomplish something, and um, and that drives your passion just that inner relationships. And knowing that you're every day, you're hopefully going home and making your workplace a little bit better each day. I think um, my father instilled in me that being fair with your customers, uh, being right up front, make your customer feel like he is number one, and that's what we try to do. And it's amazing how that works. And um, when I have sales meetings with my uh, sales staff, that's one thing I, I try to do is make sure that their presence, when they go out to our customers, that they are number one. We're trying to help them. We're trying to uh, stock what they need. And it really works. I mean, being trusted, as long as we've been in business in Canton, when you say Wolkoff Industrial, not many people have bad things to say about us. It's all pretty good. And that's what drives us to keep going back to work and naturally, you're going to be in retail. That is a very tough business because the customer feels that he's always right. And there's always someone out there that's going to give them a better price. But do they give you better service? And that's what we instill, I instill in my son and in my people that work for me, service is number one in business. And it will help you prosper greatly. Yeah, I think what uh, Mr. Wolkoff just said basically would apply to say, so many of us up here. And I, I would take that right to the practice of law, to I, I think that, you know, when I get up in the morning and I go to work, what's the main reason I'm doing this? It really is to serve people, clients who are really depending on them, you know, to get something done for them, who need something done. And, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of times when I can say, yeah, I wouldn't mind taking the afternoon off and maybe one enjoying something, going fishing or playing golf or something, and I think, well, if I do that, and this person is going to be going, wait on me another day. And I just, that really motivates me. You know, I think a lot of people will go to any profession thinking that the key is maybe they want to make Money, they want to get rich, but I think it, as time goes on, they're usually not going to be very happy. I think when you're out serving somebody and helping somebody, like Mr. Wolf 
boss said, come here, Lord, you'll be taken care of. And you're also doing the right thing. And I think in all, you know, there's so much justice that needs to be done, whether it's in a very small situation or a large situation. And you know you're participating in something that is beneficial to maybe not one person, but maybe a lot of people. It's a reward. And it, it just helps you get up every day. I had a college professor tell me, find something that you love to do and then get people to pay you for it. Not everybody can do that when you're on a job. But he also said, you're at work. 60%, 60 to 70% of your waking hours when you're awake. So if you're not enjoying work, you're not enjoying life. If you're sitting there in front of the TV after you start your career on a Sunday evening, and say to yourself, oh gosh, I have to go to work tomorrow. Oh, I just can't stand it. Time to change careers or time to change your job. I was close to having something that I love to do because those Sunday nights I couldn't wait. Well, I mean, I'd love to go golfing and go play tennis instead, but uh, working on a project with a team, I was in structures, so it might have been a bridge uh, that I was working on at the time. And then seeing that bridge constructed, and it's still out there today. I can drive you over the county. There's 400 bridges out there, some huge, some not so big. But working together as a team to put something together, taking out a low limit bridge, that farm vehicles could not get their goods to market, that school buses could not get their kids to school, they had to take a detour around. Getting that low limit bridge out and putting a brand new bridge in there really made me feel good. I know the traveling public just drove over it like it's about time to replace that bridge, but for me, it was a satisfying feeling, and that's where my career went. And I really enjoyed it, and I hope you find a career like that too. For me, you can't have a bad day in an elementary school. You see those children coming in with all kinds of enthusiasm and desire to learn. There's nothing more rewarding than teaching a child to read or to be able to do a subject area that they love. As educators, we are very blessed because every day we are creating the future. The time and energy that we devote to every young person is so, so important because we do not know who is going to be the next president. And we might be one of those people is touching that child's life. Every single young person has such potential, and to realize that you get to be a part of that brings such joy. I will say that there were times that you felt challenged. There were children that might have uh, different ways of thinking, their reason for being in school, but that was good, to be able to be a problem solver and to be able to help them feel good about who they are and what their future will be. As I sit here and look out at you young people, you are some of the ones, many of the ones, the Canton City educators have the pleasure of instructing. And also, we get pleasure by seeing where you are today. So thank you for being a product of the Kansas City Schools. I think I speak for everyone up here when I personally would like to say a thank you for all the teachers that I've had throughout grade school, junior high, high school, even throughout my career as I'm sitting there writing a paper. I thank Ms. Hickman I had in as a junior in high school taught me English, uh, the math that I did in engineering. Ms. Hopkins at Canton Lincoln, she's a uh, real force in my career. And I know I could go down the table and you, you remember all your teachers, just like you have some of your grade school teachers. And they are the foundation for our career. So they've done an excellent job and are worth a round of applause. Okay, do we have any more questions? I'm going to try to 
Hello. I just like sort of just wrote something up really quick. So Chelsea Bailey, I graduated in 2016. Got into Yale. I went to Yale. <laughs> so like, yes, that works. Um, at early college, I did the Associates of General Arts and General Sciences. So I took extra classes. It was sort of rough. I got through it. So right now, yeah, I guess I'm trying to be a global affairs major. So I work at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. So you guys have any questions about college life? I live in a suite of six people, and three of them are international. So if you guys need, <laughs> yes. Did they take your credits? Okay, so the way it works, depending on where you go out of state, they can take it. I opted not to have that done, so I could just do advanced classes instead. Yes. Even though you didn't have credits to answer, do you think that it helped you to be early college and have that experience? Yeah, yeah, it did. Definitely, because there's a lot of kids there right now, and they're from like the prep schools and all of that and they don't know how to balance the workload, they're used to like, someone holding their hand the entire time and it's not working for them. So it, it's very helpful, it's great. <laughs> Any other questions? It would be, but my dad's a truck driver so he's able to come up and visit like on the weekends. But the first time in the laundry room at the college, it was very funny because most of the students had never been there. So all the international students were afraid of like the lint in the filters. <laughs> so so it's hard being away from home, but it's hilarious at the same time. What's your major? Global Affairs and MCDB, which is Molecular Cellular Developmental Biology. Societies like they're definitely prevalent. 
So those are ways to make friends too. I don't regret it at all because, like, uh, like with their financial aid and everything, uh, Harvard and Yale Princeton have this thing where if you can get in, you will, you are able to go for free. So it's great in that regard. And then, so we just had the Harvard Yale game, and we beat Harvard. So you know, for some like nine years, but you know, we changed it. It's great. But at Harvard, it's more cutthroat. So. Even though I'm going to Yale for undergrad, it is better for undergrad, and it's Yale. Yale is not the best for graduate school. So they care more about the undergrad, and Harvard cares more about the graduate students. So in regards, like, I don't regret Yale, because it's literally the best of the ideas for undergrads. But I'm not going to go there for graduate school, because that would be Thank you, Chelsea. Um, one other thing I want to make sure I, I leave a message with you guys. I want y'all to know that we're really proud of all of you, even from the camp, current camp students to our grads. We are very, very proud of you guys. And also, our, I want to mention our tech students, too, because those kids are phenomenal. We, we built up on that program as well. And um, we're really proud of the work and the effort that you're putting in to be a part of this program, to do your work here at school in order to become successful. Um, just always remember that and always know that we're here. We're not that far away. You know, Mr. Brunner's here, I'm here, Mrs. Meyer, Ms. Um, um, Miser, and um, even the operating committee. Just make sure that you're touching base with us, keeping us in the loop, talking to us, because that's what we're here for. We're like an extended family, okay? I want y'all to always remember that. Um, don't forget the holiday camp celebration. So make sure you get, I don't know where that sheet went, but I don't know where it ended up. Just, because if everybody, if you didn't fill it out, make sure you get to it or you give me your slip, okay? And I'll take care of from there. And I think that wraps up our seminar today. I know it's a little early, but it wraps it up. And we thank you for coming and also have a safe and warm day and then happy Thanksgiving to all of you, okay? Thank you.